So now, uh, this session is more about having a conversation. And with Stuart, what we would like is, like, if you have a question, if you want to intervene, if you want to interrupt, do not hesitate. Please feel at ease. And we'd like to have a bit of an interactive session. We'd like for the room to participate. We don't want to have a very formal um, type of presentation. So I'd like to come back to the to the excellent presentation of Stuart this morning, um, because I. Can you hear me now? Is it working? It's on channel two. Can you hear me now? Is it working? Is it working on channel two? Yep. Is it working? Is it working? One, two, one, two. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Super. Fantastic. <coughs> All right. So I just wanted to maybe start with a question for Stuart regarding his presentation of this morning. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'll start with just the one. And um, he demonstrated this morning brilliantly that our communities, you know, our, I mean, I don't like to talk about the gay community because that's a bit of an abstract value to me, but in our groups, in our communities, we do have some vulnerability factors that have been inherited from homophobia, from, you know, trauma, from, you know, a lot of different things from childhood as well, and from some of our history as well. So how do, do you explain today something very simple? I mean, how do you explain that our groups and some in our groups uh, reproduce this, this system that excludes others, some of our own? Sure, I understand the question. How do you explain, how do you explain that, you know, all those mechanisms, homophobia, homophobia within the family, stigma, representation, um, that gay people have experienced since their childhood. You know, most of, our, most of the people in our groups have experienced that from childhood and they reproduce that themselves within the community. They reproduced, in a way, homophobia rejection of other members of the same community. Do you have an explanation for that? I think, you know, it, the first thing that I'm thinking of is um, sometimes when, because eight, um, LGBT people often talk about bullying and so, and you know, I, I experienced bullying when I was younger and one of the things that I think is really interesting, um, if you have a bully in a family like, you know, a, a young son who goes to school and bullies kids, he's kind of like absorbed a lot of is what is in his family system and he takes that, um, what his experience say from his father and then acts it out on other people and you know there are lots of different reasons for that. For example, um, you know, he feels powerless in that family system and, and um, feels less than and then, but because he's learned this or, or watched his father do it to him, he then acts it out on the people at school so that he can find some sense of power. Um, and, you know, almost act as though he has some self-esteem, although we all know it's not self-esteem, it's actually low self-esteem that makes a person do that. So I'm thinking that, like, yes, when, when we are, you know, people in the LGBT community and we experience stigma and marginalisation and homophobia itself, I think, um, I think it's a very similar thing uh, that we go and um, perpetrate it on our own kind, our own people, you know, and I think if there is a... I mean, I might get criticised for this, but I do think in general there's a lot of low self-esteem in the LGBT community because we've grown up um, absorbing, you know, messages from society and from our families and um, from so many different places about how bad we are or how disgusting our, the way we are sexually is and on so many levels. And so I do think if we're unconscious or we don't have the resources growing up, we do act that out on other people, you know, put them down, say that they're disgusting or or attack them for some something about them that is makes them uniquely LGBT. Um, and yes, I agree with you. I think it's incredibly sad to witness this happening. And, you know, one of the things we've found at R12 in Thailand with the LGBT clients is that internalised homophobia is one of the um, really big secondary underlying factors that we have to deal with. We even run groups on it and, and bring it to people's awareness and, you know, um, sometimes people say they have no, they had no idea that they were full of internalised homophobia and, and sometimes it's kind of like a, 
you know, a, a wart or something in a way, like you, you, when they become aware of it and you burst it, it actually empties out pretty quickly because people say, I don't want to be like that. I'm, now I'm aware of it. I want to become the best version of myself. I want to be kind and caring to, the, to my other LGBT brothers and sisters. Yeah. Um, okay, so another question. We are going to try to um, orient that questions uh, that question on chemsex as well. We'd like to deal with chemsex. Do you do you guys need us to come back to some uh, definitions? Maybe are you all at ease with the with the theme, or do you have any questions? Okay, on va on va en parler. Je peux vous répondre. Oui, je peux vous répondre. My name is Fred Bladou. I work for Ed. I also uh, administer the consumption uh, room in Paris. And I've been working uh, on chemsex for about six years now, so more or less six years. So since the emergence uh, of, of chemsex um, in France, and chemsex is, as Stuart said this morning, chemsex is the use of psychoactive products um, for sexual aims. Uh, so we cannot dissociate the sexual uh, goal or the sexual motivation from the use of the products, for the, from the use of products. Yeah, sorry. The interpreter had difficulties hearing with the microphone. So um, in general, regarding the specific question of products, the products that are used, regardless of the mode of consumption, are systematically stimulants. Cocaine, meth, crystal meth. Um, all of the new synthetic drugs, um, catenone category, me uh, methadrone, and so on and so forth. So you do have a lot of different molecules, different products that can be used, and the only product that is not a stimulant is GHB, but uh, GHB plus GBL is consumed in that context, and with uh, at some dose, it can also disinhibit, disinhibit. it has a, has a disinhibiting effect. Um, and so they have in common that sentiment of performance, that feeling of, um, you know, within a fr sexual framework, you look for, a, um, you don't want to be inhibited, inhibited, you want to be, a, um, you want to have superpowers to some extent. Uh, you want to have behaviors that you might not have allowed yourself to have without the products. So you use substances that make it possible for you to reach that goal. And so within the framework of my of my job, Ed is an association of, um, we fight against uh, v, um, HIV and hepatitis as well, and we're a um, um, risk structure. Historically, we, we try to, to reduce the risks. When we started working on chemsex, when we encountered the first cases of uh, persons that we welcomed and that arrived, we felt... I mean, what is that even about, and where is that moving towards? I mean, the use of drug drugs, we said it this morning, um, in MSM communities with gay people the, within a sexual context, it always existed. Chemsex did not invent anything. The only difference is that now the practice has been ritualized and has very, um, very specific codes that are specific to chemsex. So with the arrival of new products, synthetic drugs, new synthetic drugs, and also with the idea of group sex. And another thing that really fully transformed and that really created this community is the arrival of smartphones. Because smartphones are a prolongation of your arm now and since smartphones are available you no longer to a place you no longer go to places that are friendly you meet a person directly on the internet you no longer need to um, um, get in touch with a traditional dealer so you no longer need to know or identify a dealer which is not always easily accessible depending on where you live you do everything on your phone you recruit your sexual partners via apps that are dedicated or used specifically for that the 
psychoactive products purchases are delivered right at home in your mailbox. So Chemsex is really a mix of everything. New synthetic products that are hyper stimulating mixed together with new technologies and the society that we spoke of this morning, um, you know, that, that society of performance, of speed and um, Chemsex to me is a hundred percent like the best possible example that illustrates what you said this morning regarding the, the society of performance of demands where weakness is no longer possible and we saw it arrive really early in chemsex um, we're no longer a gay person having sexual practices as anybody would um, or who will have a partner we are someone who really looks for hyper-consumption, for consumption in any case, for very strong consumption of sexual relationships with a lot of different partners, enhanced by products. And um, it's really, um, I mean, performance is key, and it's, uh, it's exactly what you described this morning. So we're um, uh, an association that fights um, AIDS, fights um, HIV, and the first cases we saw I mean, the first question we had to we had to face, we, we were faced with people who are not classic drug users. We were no longer dealing with people who have a relatively good knowledge of risk reduction and exchanging syringes and so on and so forth. You, you have very new profiles that are uh, injecting themselves with products, which can lead to a lot of different problems, of course you know, um, problems due to the injection itself, but also contamination, HIV and Hep C. So it took a couple of years for us to, to adapt. At the beginning, first of all, we tried to understand the products, the practices. We created a, as I said at the beginning of my intervention, uh, with chemsex, it's impossible to dissociate sexuality and drug use. So we were, um, relatively, you know, at Ed, we were relatively peaceful. We had a lot of different types of, um, of audiences. We had gay people on the one side, so we did sex prevention. And for, for years, we worked. I mean, we raised awareness and we distributed uh, condoms because we didn't really have a lot of other means to, um, to do prevention apart from distributing condoms. And then we also had drug users. And to drug users, we never spoke of sexuality because most of them were just opiates consumers. And the question of sexuality was not really very important. Chemsex made it necessary for us to con completely change our approach and our perception of new audiences because all of a sudden we could no longer be satisfied with risk, risk reduction as we did previously saying okay so here is a sterile syringe it will be enough to protect you because it's no longer true or here is a condom and let's move on to the next guy so it's, it was very interesting to start working on both aspects at once systematically in parallel and never dissociating them so um, we, we spoke of RDR in the other uh, workshop. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go fast so that I can give the flow back to you. But anyway, so today, what's the, what is the, 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 the strategy for an association like Ed? We have about 20 sites in France. And um, the idea is to help chemsexes to give them every possible method for risk reduction, even very inno innovative uh, solutions. So we try to provide injection support. And um, I mean, we do everything we can in order to avoid contamination because of drug use. And we also offer those people um, that we help, we give them a lot of behavioral and biomedicalized prevention for HIV and he uh, Hep C. We encourage them to go to screening tests, and we uh, again have a lot of biomedicalized uh, means that we have available today. And another aspect which could be interesting also has to do with providing support to people, providing support to users. There are a lot of things that have been said uh, since this morning about feeling isolated, about the ability to find, you know, eight years ago before doctors and addictologists were um, 
supported before awareness campaigns regarding the very specific question of use uh, of products within a sexual context in gay people that took hours of training and hours of awareness raising and now we have specific places where um, the people who carry out those practices can come. Um, drug use and um, as well as being a member of, LG of the LGBT community can be a, a factor of discrimination. So for socially integrated gay people, um, you go a little bit outside of the, of, the, of the problematic use, you know, of drugs on the streets and so on and so forth. So now we deal with people who are not always aware um, of the problems. They are not aware uh, of, of the risks. And so that's what we do. That's what we do today. We try to bolster their ability to protect themselves, to reinforce their ability to protect themselves sexually, but also in terms of drug use. And we try to provide them with a safe space where they can be listened to. We talked about Le Spot this morning with the self-support group. We have partnerships, which is very new in risk reduction with psychological and addictology uh, structures, because for some people, um, it's really something that could be considered. It's something that they need need. And um, yeah, so the aim of my intervention was really to try and um, tell you that chemsex is not one problem. It's one. It's not one issue. It's a very complicated situation because we are faced with an emerging practice that is gaining momentum. And that is, I mean, it's not just about dealing with addiction. It's also dealing about the person's holistic health. I'm sorry, I, that was a bit long. Do you have any questions? The interpreter cannot translate the question if there is no microphone use. We see that a little. It's starting. Uh, it's not very well document documented. I think the question was, do we have that behavior in uh, heterosexual uh, uh, communities as well? And um, um, the answer is yes for um, ravers, for example, rave parties, and also uh, libertine kind of um, swingers. Um, uh, communities. The advantage of synthetic drugs is that their prices, their prices, is really, really low. And in rave parties, like techno parties and so on and so forth, you do have a lot of people swapping products. A stimulant that makes it possible for you to stay awake for hours on end, um, of course, will be interesting to an audience like that because of the type of products that they consume usually. And um, and so you see that in rave parties more and more, not always in a sexual context, but we do see it nonetheless. And also we have to find inspiration in other countries. I remember four years ago, I saw a presentation in Stockholm um, where my Hungarian uh, comrades, they were working on risk reduction, but not at all with the gay community the general population and um, the, 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 the new drugs arrived massively because heroin was rare in Hungary. So people moved on to a new product. They tried to, to, to find something else and consumption or yeah, the sexual consumption exploded, boomed completely because you're dealing with products that uh, remove inhibitions and that are um, that create pathologies and so you see the same characteristics in other groups not just the gay community yeah I'm Stefan from Ed as well I um, I have been working at uh, Le Spot for pretty much forever. I uh, have a group every Tuesday. Fred explained it really well. That phenomenon exists, well, has been present since 2011. We have products that are easily accessible. We have smartphones, um, so it's easy to uh, it's easy to find supply, and you could choose a guy on on, on catalog basically. Um, and you could move on to the next very easily. It's hyper consumption, definitely. So we have to work on self image as well. If you're not within the right standards, if physically you're not, um, if you don't look like, yeah, if you're not fit, uh, young, and so on and so forth, and ideally seronegative negative as well, you know, th th it's it's very difficult. Uh, we talked about in, in exclusive 
community, it's true, and it can be very violent, actually. And taking drugs can be a way to escape, can be a way to try and be integrated into those subgroups. The problem of artificial paradises is that on Monday morning or on Tuesday or on Wednesday, because sometimes you start on Friday and then it continues all through Sunday, all through Sunday, and sometimes it finishes on Monday and sometimes it finishes on Tuesday and then you lose your job. What I mean to say is that there's a hyper consumption of those products. There are poli consumption of different products as well at once, even though um, uh, the, the gay community tends to know the products relatively well. We still do, I mean, in, in France, I wonder if it's not a health crisis, a full-blown health crisis. London is an example as well. London reacted 10 years ago, actually. The, uh, the whole community reacted. But in France, we were running very late on that theme. And what I see at the spot is that we see people arrive that are that have hit rock bottom, they're not doing well, they're desocialized, they have lost their jobs, they don't know how to get out of their situation. I remember there was a guy who came up, he had gone through six months of psychotherapy, and he came to me for the first time, he told me, I uh, tried to commit suicide twice over the past uh, uh, six months, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then at the end of the conversation uh, with the peers, he said, okay, well, I think I think I can see a light at the end of the tunnel now. And so it's important to also talk about self-support. It's important for those audiences to become aware of the situation they're in. Some of them can also detect other people who are not doing well. Let's say, I mean, we're talking about gay people. It could be heterosexual people as well. When you take too many... Um, you know, stimulants because you're not doing well or because you, you're lacking energy. Maybe you need to ask yourself why you're lacking energy. Why are you doing so bad that you need to take something? And the people who are consuming drugs now, you know, like happy consumers now um, that are that are still using that recreatively, how can we make sure that they remain happy consumers? Because sometimes people are in an addictive situation, but they don't realize that they are in an addictive situation or until the day where they get a health problem or where sometimes you have cases also, you know, every morning uh, Facebook uh, is now a, a, you know, on Facebook you, you discover uh, who died during the weekend because of, because of those sex marathons. So there's a real phenomenon nowadays and it's important to detect the problematic cases upstream not to create a stigma but just to make them aware of the fact that if you've been using all weekend if you don't see your friends if you don't see your family anymore if you have professional difficulties also because of this you need to ask yourself why you're doing that um, what was the specific question again <laughs> Sure. Mainly talking about treatment modalities and pretty much how do you deal with people coming to oh. Treat, treatment modalities. I mean, most of my experience has been with 12-step, but I mean, obviously at R12 we, we offer everything on the continuum. And, you know, I think, it's, I think it's a very challenging thing. I was having a conversation with someone about this last night just in that um, I think it's really important to be able to offer as many different um, ways of dealing with chemsex as possible. I mean... You know, I, I got sober 16 years ago. I went through 10 months of residential treatment to get on top of it. And, you know, like, so for example, if I have a client come to our, or just a person ring up on the phone and say they want to do 28 days treatment residential for chemsex, I say, forget it. I don't think it's going to work. Um, so, like, we don't do anything less than 60 days for this. And, and I, I say that not just from a professional opinion. I say it from my own personal experience. I was a very, very focused and dedicated recovering addict. And it still took me um, six months in residential, four, four months in a halfway house, and then another ten months in a three-quarter way house. You know, and, and you know, like, I've, we probably all have different um, attitudes to this. I've heard of other people who don't like residential treatment or who don't like 12-step who found a way to... Um, use harm reduction to get an enjoyable life. So um, I really think that, the, 
for everybody, there's a different way of dealing with this. I'm just partial, obviously, to 12-step because it's what happened for me and it's worked very well for me and I, you know, and I will offer that as much as possible to somebody. However, if they say, look, I don't like this, this doesn't work for me, then we will definitely go down other paths or recommend to other organisations. Um, oui, je voudrais bien poser une question. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to Stuart. Um, uh, that you were talking about earlier. Um, you were saying, uh, I work in a residential treatment where the focus is on group therapy um, in France, uh, where <coughs> we have uh, a small amount of this population that we've been talking about coming in to treatment and how difficult it is to dissociate, not that it's a question of dissociating, but of working on the identity issues and the sexual issues and the drug use issues. And um, I have often come to think that uh, this sort of profile has a lot of difficulties identifying with simple drug users, if I can say that, um, and that... Uh, uh, that identification issue is so important in group work and that's what um, I was actually wondering if if you came to what you're doing today because you realised that it was almost impossible to treat this sort of addiction because it's a double addiction, and comorbidity, to um, with a mixed population. Is, do you think treatment is easier because you have people all having had the same experience? Hmm. <laughs> I think, um, you know... F f and is that the only way to go, in other words? I don't think it's the only way to go because, you know, like as I said, uh, I started treatment 16 years ago and when I went to rehab, there was, in the whole six months I was in rehab, there was myself and two other gay guys who were there for crystal meth and ultimately chemsex, though it wasn't called that at the time. And, you know, one of the things, uh, even in in that rehab was that the three of us, did, we talked together, but we didn't, you know, and had a bit of identification. But what I know for myself when I got out of treatment, like, and I heard about, for example, Crystal Meth Anonymous, this 12-step group in the US, my mind was blown because I'd only ever gone to Narcotics Anonymous meetings and where people were talking about heroin and prescription drugs and I had zilch identification. Sometimes I'd be sitting there, I knew I couldn't go out and use crystal meth because, you know, or do chemsex because it was, I was psychotic and I was going to die. But I also sometimes sat in those meetings going, I've never used heroin. I've never, you know, gone to a doctor for prescription meds. You know, I've never stolen money off someone. You know, I completely de-identified with what I was hearing and yet I stayed there and fortunately I was able to hear beyond that but that's why we started Crystal Meth Anonymous in Sydney for the reason I think you just said was it was like I want to sit in a room where I identify with everyone else talking about HIV, talking about extreme sexual behaviour, talking about intravenous drug use, talking about the difference between GBL and GBH and, you know, there are all these significant intricacies of chemsex that I was not hearing in rehab really, that I was not hearing any, anywhere else in, in other 12-step programs. So w the question I think too that you asked was about working say for example in R12 now and working with a gayer population, um, we do get, predominantly we probably have 90% gay men come to R12 and I would say of that amount maybe 60% of them are there for chemsex and we, we run a specific chemsex track but you know on my travels around the world I noticed most organisations now are running specific chemsex tracks and I think yes this is the reason why there's a really... Um, there's a really uh, specific identification that needs to be experienced by people to be able to feel that there's hope, that people understand, that, un that, you know, they, that even therapists have empathy for what I'm going through, which is different to other drugs. And as you said, this is not just about the drug or drugs, this is about problematic sexual behaviour. And, you know, I, I have, I mean, I'm a certified sex addiction therapist too, trained in the Patrick Carnes model. And so one of the, I think, the biggest misunderstandings that people say is that chemsex guys are sex addicts. It's not true. They're, they're using really um, drugs that make them hypersexual. I, I can t say this from personal experience. I went to treatment going, oh, I've, I'm a drug addict and a sex addict. The minute I stopped using crystal meth and, and GHB, my libido norm normalised and suddenly I didn't crave sex anymore. You know, I still had a drug problem, but I kind of went, okay, I'm not a sex addict. That's at least one thing I can 
you know, put back there and just focus on the drugs. So I think, you know, I feel lucky that I've been around, you know, I've had a, I've had a personal experience of this and plus I've studied a lot about it in that I can go in and work with chemsex uh, clients and know these in, in, um, intricacies. I think in a mainstream program, I have heard people say, oh, they're a sex addict because they're having a lot of sex. It's just not true. And so then they get given treatment that is not relevant to them. Which just reinforces the denial and makes the treatment a more complex. Yeah, well, um, well and just and, just confusing for yeah, the client as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Bonjour, Jean. Good afternoon, Jean Maxence. From I'm an expert in, in edutology and uh, I'm part of certain health self help groups. And I wanted to say there are twelve step pro programs that are focused, even if they're open groups. Uh, they're focused on LGBT group people. There's at least one in Paris that works well, where these issues are discussed by people, um, the people looking for rehab in this type of uh, context. And we often hear, we hear about chemsex more and more. So I had a question, which was, do we, uh, are we able to distinguish, insofar as possible, people who have practices, uh, recreational practices, uh, this is not this invasive nature that you're describing on Monday morning, which goes on to Tuesday, and then um, it, t it tends to inhabit your whole uh, li people's entire lives. Is there a proportion? Is there a prevalence of ex what is the prevalence of excessive behaviour? When you when you look at it from far away, it seems excessive. But are there people who manage to moderate the, their behaviour? You discuss, and as you discuss there, I had another question because I come out of the uh, workshop on the sexual addiction. And um, is it clear whether it's a a sexual dependency, a sexual addiction that is based on products, or is it an addiction to products that that are in line with sexual practices? Um, I had that question, and and I asked it again, even if you just part in answered in that question in part. So on controlled consumption, non-problematic uh, consumption, yes, that exists. There are people who are chemsexers, who have limits, who know their risks, who know the possible risks. There are often groups who people know each other well. Uh, the, the visibility of some, some people who go, kind of go off the deep end, uh, people aren't alone. They're on, the, on their own. They can see perfectly well that contrary to a user who injects or consumes on their own in home in a rural environment who never sees anyone else in chemsex you have this thing that saves us saves us is that there are people in groups at least two people so they can see how quick uh, behavior consumption become catastrophic so for some people there is a really a controlled uh, consumption. This goes along, often goes along with classical risk reduction consumption, which would be consumption once a month. We give them tips to help them not uh, exceed or to move over to the dark side and lose, uh, go over the deep ends, which would be limiting the quantity, certain quantity of consumption, not to consume other people's drugs. Even if with a group, uh, group assess practices, we give them tips like that. And it's like with any any substance. There's really a context. It's really context dependent. Um, somebody who's socialized, who is uh, comfortable with them, not uh, good self-esteem and not suffering, is someone who will be able to potentially uh, con completely control their consumption. Someone, it also depends on the product though. We have a big problem with the catenon. Uh, which is that uh, the come down is really hard to handle. Uh, people, people have um, the come down when they stop. Uh, the come down start lasts from Sunday to Tuesday or Wednesday. They have a depressive state. They have dark thoughts, and that doesn't help at all. And some people reconsume to escape from the from this uh, this this come down, which is not a craving, but it's just a, is a come a come down. So that was your first question. Your second question, I can't remember. It was the connection. Um, I ca I can't can answer the question, but uh, maybe Stuart can answer. But I think uh, exactly the same thing as him that 
some people in Kensex maybe were uh, consumed a lot. Um, I, I'm t with, with respect to uh, sex addiction, or maybe they were they were hypersexual before chemsex or not. I don't know. Maybe some people, as this is what Stefan described, um, which I found interesting, is that a lot of them. I see a lot of people. At one point, I had up to ten interviews per day, and there's often s people talk about. Uh, in terms of their motivations, it is firstly, first and foremost, an, a feeling of isolation. People are bored, they're on their own, they don't have a boyfriend, they're not having sex. <coughs> or because I'm 45 years old, I'm too old in the gay community, I'm zero positive and it's hard because I've been, uh, a vict I've been rejected a lot and because I don't have a, an amazing body, so it's difficult for me to go out to a club. So Kemsek represented and still represents for some people a, uh, a release, a, a feeling of uh, freedom, liberation. There's a, there's this kind of feeling that w why I often say is that when it's a it's a guy's lover or the husband who calls me and asks me what can I do because my my boyfriend is uh, got, has um, has gone over the deep end. What can I help? How can I help them? How can I help them? And that's why here people guys come to see him and say, uh, I haven't had any sex for 15 years. I had no confidence in myself. Chemsex enabled me to have partners, allowed me to to have fun. Uh, so the question of boredom is a problem. There's a real an issue of uh, w will and a, a need to uh, be identified with a group, to be part of a group. So it's a sex addiction, I don't know. It depends on the person. Uh, but these are products that change would change anyone. They would change the Pope into uh, a porn star. That's that's all. The, also, the characteristic of the product is even when you don't have a libido, you take some and you just want to, do you want to have sex? I mean, with the first question about moderate sex, um, you know, one of the, there's a author in the US uh, called Michael Clemens and he, he describes that there's three kinds of people in dr engaging with drugs, that's drug users, drug abusers and drug addicts. And drug users are the kinds of people that, you know, I'm very jealous of. They can engage in this kind of behaviour with no consequences, and they are very um, um, manageable and regulated. And they, they, you know, pack everything up at four o'clock in the morning and go to bed, and they're ready for work on Monday morning. And then there's drug uh, drug abusers, and they're the kinds of people where things start, you know, the wheels start to fall off, and you know, things don't go right. And they say, okay, what do I need to do here to get this right? They might do a few counselling sessions. They might even go to rehab for 28 days or whatever, but they don't need to go to 12-step and they don't need to choose abstinence. They Sometimes I've seen they completely switch, you know, their chemsex behaviours to exercise or, you know, they get more focused on their work or they get really, really involved in their relationship or they they just sort of grow out of it too. And, and I did over the years, I've experienced that people like this exist as well. And then drug addicts are the people like myself, really, who, like, every weekend I would go on a, you know, three- or four-day binge and I would completely wreck myself and put myself in dangerous situations. And I would, um, you know, by... Well, it wouldn't be Sunday night, but by Tuesday night I'd be stopping and I'd be saying to myself, I'm never going to let that happen again. That was the most stupid thing I've ever done, you know, using in injecting drugs and, you know, s sleeping with people I don't want to sleep with for four or five days in a row is not a good idea and five days would pass, you know, I'd get my dope mean back and then suddenly I'd be searching online to do it all again and I did that for you know six years really you know so we're the kinds of people that no matter what make what makes rational sense to do we would still go back and do do that behavior and we're the kind of people that kind of do need abstinence and do need 12-step uh, programs and so every I think everyone is different who engages with this behavior um, <clears throat> I think, look, it, I said before, I, I think roughly 60 of our clients, you know, have um, uh, probably come for chemsex to R12. Only two of them really put their hands up to say, I think I'm a sex addict as well. Um, so the majority of them, in my, ex my experience, are definitely not sex addicts. Um, and one of, the, one of the guys that um, raised this with me, you know, because... 
if often I will tell them what the, the Patrick Kahn's model is and how we go about it. And I don't know if you can imagine this, but most of them just say, no way, I'm not going near that because they have to do a very strict abstinence contract which takes masturbation out and you know junk food and loads of different things. And so they're pretty much saying no before I even get to explaining the contract. Um, except you know, I went over it one day with a guy and I, w and I was really thinking he'd be like all the other guys and say, no, I'm, I'm definitely not a sex addict. And, he's, and I went through it and he said, no, I'm a sex addict. And I said, are you sure? And he said, I was doing this behaviour before I ever used drugs. I was going to toilets to get off with people at the age of 15, you know, and he was telling me that. And as he told me about his history before he found crystal meth and GHP, I went, okay, I believe you that you're definitely... Um, fit into this category of sex addict. But I do, me personally, I, I don't believe that most um, gay men are sex addicts that, I, that I've worked with who come to me for chemsex. Um, no, I, th I think I answered both questions. Yeah. Last words? Dernier mot? Non, c'est très. Non, je, je voudrais. Il y a quelque chose que tu viens de dire que je trouve très très intéressant dans ton exemple, où tu as dit euh, quand je pensais le mardi soir. Euh oh, sorry, sorry, wrong channel. Uh, something you said really interesting is that um, when you said about your come down, why did I do that all, all weekend, and why did I sleep with the people uh, that I didn't wouldn't have wanted to sleep with otherwise? It's maybe. S and I'd like to conclude with this. I'm happy to conclude with this. Is it also some? It's also a question we often ask ourselves, or a question we try to answer, and we have to, and something needs to be answered to the people who come to see, to see us for support, is that when you get into chemsex, it's often to have sex, to have sexual relations, uninhibited sexual relations, to, to rediscover a notion of pleasure that you didn't dare to have other eyes without, uh, without consuming drugs. And what often people describe to us is that I, I slept with so many people, with people I never, I didn't want to sleep with, with the problems that this can imply, or the related problems, uh, problems of violence, of sexual abuse, uh, some people, things that people are, are very hard to live with. And that's one of the issues uh, on camp sex that we don't talk enough about, or uh, maybe in long-term care, yes, which is, uh, going towards these practices to be disinhibited and then in, uh, ultimately becoming imprisoned by them and the sexual the liberation that you've you've achieved uh, you become a prisoner of because you don't know how to get over, out of it or you have the wrong partners so that's a real issue today and it's real concern for users uh, is with res with respect to issues of guilt and self-esteem because sex should be a um, fulfilling, a fulfilling or uh, action activity that makes you happy, and with the come down and everything, uh, people have difficulty um, accepting the practices that they've uh, engaged in.